All right. So I've been excited about this for two months, and I can't believe I kept it to myself for two months. This was going to happen. Also wanted to make sure that we had a scheduled date before I announced anything. But it is my honor to introduce, I don't want to say a friend, but I, so the good thing about what I do on my side gig is that nine times out of 10, you do your little thing with the Q&A, you walk off the stage, you shake hands, something like that. And then every once in a while, you hit it off and you talk after stage for 30 minutes. And that's what happened to Mark Ralston and I is it's like, oh, I'm going to talk to this chubby guy from Eastern Kentucky for a few minutes. We seem to get along. And you were fantastic in Richmond a few months ago. Thanks. But what I want to say is, is that you promised me something. You said you would do the show. And I've been told that before. And I won't say who has lied to me over the years. But there's been a couple as you work in Hollywood, you might imagine. Right, right. Are you shocked mm -hmm. at all? Not at all. In fact, I mean, I'll admit on camera that I was late. <laughs> so I, <laughs> we my apologies. It. I'm normally extremely punctual, but uh, yeah, so, no. I just want to talk about you. I did. We did mutual favors for one another, and you're a minch, and I really appreciate it for you. Thank you oh, so much. My, for doing my absolute pleasure. I had a great time in Kentucky. Did you really? It was a kind of a oh, small yeah. show, and it wasn't. I, you, you, and that show deserved a better crowd, a bigger crowd, I should say. Well, I don't know what happened there, but uh, I'm hoping we can get back to Lexington. Apparently, that's a nice big show. So, oh, oh yes, that's my big show. That's that's uh, that's thirty thirty thirty, getting close to forty thousand. It's nice because you would think Cincinnati, Louisville, some of those places that have a bigger one. If it's not, it's in Lexington, and the biggest yeah. horror convention horror movie convention probably the second or third biggest one in the united states now is in lexington kentucky at scarefest i yeah. talked about this and i i was putting it on your radar and we talked to your agent about it as well so right. love for you to get to either one oh absolutely i want to get there because uh i met some really nice fellas in richmond who uh treated me to some tipple of uh, kentucky bourbon and i want to go to the bourbon trail oh yes uh, we have well, actually what I have here is scotch, but the bourbon's in the M and M behind me, oddly enough. Yeah, so. my, my mine's that way. <laughs> so, Mark, if you get back here, what we'll do, the boneheads will actually, uh, if you will allow us, uh, we'll we'll take you out for some uh, bourbon sipping. Very nice. I would like that. I will nice. take it. We will we will make that happen. So, let's go ahead and get started. Um. I was trying, so what we pride ourselves, not first of all, that you're going to have a good time while we do this. And second of all, we're going to joke and kid, but third, we try not to ask shit that people ask continuously every time. So Chad and I, when we had that extra few minutes before you got on, was like, all right, let's throw out the aliens questions. Let's throw out the Shawshank questions. He's been asked that shit 42,000 fucking times. We're not going to ask it. <laughs> so Which I, 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 even, I, I even told Joe, not even on my list. <laughs> Oh, good. <laughs> Hopefully that makes you feel better. I may have a Shawshank thing I might ask later, but we'll see how it goes. I just, I'm curious, being raised by a single dad, how that affected you a little bit. And because I, we're going to get to your philosophy major. By the way, we did our research. We're going to get to the philosophy major stuff in a little bit in England in a minute. But you're one of three, correct? Mm-hmm. And you each had to do something on Saturdays. Is that how it goes? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, Dad was like, you have to get out of the house so I can clean the house and do the laundry and pay the bills. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, my my brother chose playing the guitar. My sister danced ballet. And my father had taken us to the theater quite often in, in D.C. at the arena stage and a smaller fringe theater, which I don't know if it's still there or not, but it was called the Washington Theater Club. And they had a Saturday program for kids. And my dad said, how about that? And I thought, yeah, I'll give it a shot. And then, you know, that was kind of the start of everything because it was mainly like a improvisational, uh, you know, and games for kids, you know, with theater games. But, you know, you get reaction from people and people thought, you know, I was clever and funny and, you know, you get that feedback and kind of get bitten. Yeah, uh, I was actually asked to turn professional and join the arena stage repertory company. My father nixed that. He was like, nope, you're going to finish high school and 
after high school, you do what the hell you want to do. So, <laughs> well, I'm curious back to the being raised by a single dad. It's especially of that generation. It's shocking to me that he was laissez faire about you doing something in the arts. Well, my father, you know, he was uh, a single child of a uh, coal stoker. I mean, that my grandfather, he he worked for Bethlehem Steel, mm -hmm. and being an only child, um, they were sure that he wasn't going to be follow his his in his father's footsteps. And so, my father was an overachiever, and you know, extremely intelligent guy, and um, he wanted more from life, so he. From a very early, early age, you know, we he would take us to the theater, take us to. I remember seeing Marcel Marceau, the famous mime. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, Dad exposes to a lot of stuff, and uh, one actor in particular, this uh, actor Robert Prosky, mm -hmm. who was relatively famous. Uh, he was in Saint Elsewhere, I believe, mm -hmm. and um, there was a show of Wind in the Willows, mm -hmm. and that <laughs> just captured my imagination and attention, and um yeah it, it it sparked something in me i really really enjoyed the um my saturdays um interesting my father was actually putting me in danger because at that time you know dc was like the murder capital of the world right or detroit <laughs> right and i was was on a bus traveling you know from bethesda maryland all the way downtown to dupont circle which at the time was like you know rife with drug addicts and all kind of things but that was the era when you know your parent could say yeah just here's some money go on the bus and see you later this afternoon you know and but uh, i did it and uh survived it <laughs> it doesn't exist now the idea of me my six-year-old can talk to most people he has a lot he looks like his mother but he has a lot of my personalities outgoing it, it, even when he's nine i'm not going to do that yeah i mean you well you just can't you a you'd be Negligent. Yeah, you'd be negligent. You you have a, a charge against you. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's a shame in some ways. I mean, we were entrusted with a lot when we were kids, you know, because my dad, you know, being a single parent, he worked for IBM and he was away all day. But, uh, you know, I feel sorry for my older brother because he got burdened with, you know, trying to hold down the fort. And me being a middle child, I was pretty rambunctious. And, you know, <laughs> my brother's... Oh spent a lot of time corralling me and then fighting so um yeah it was yeah. Uh, an interesting childhood um but yeah. i think in today's in today's world you'd think it, it was it was a little bit unusual you know we, we were latchkey kids right right i was too i was too my parents split up when i was quite young and the and i'm an only child and my son's an only child so he's an only child an only child and and it's just there's things that I would just never let him do than I did. And yeah. no one thought anything of it. I remember my mom would reach me the child support check <laughs> in the morning and leaving one house just to give it. Or my dad would reach me the to give to my mom. You know, it that would it's unheard of today. Any of that stuff. So I get right. it. Completely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Chad. I'm I'm glad you said it because I was sitting here wondering the whole time when you said that you were a, a, a one of three, so you you are the middle child, so you 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 know what suffering's like, right? If you didn't get it from one side, you got it from the other. Exactly, you <laughs> bastards in your middle child syndromes, whatever. Yeah, uh, our other friend James, he is also the middle child, so <laughs> we 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 all oh. Me and Mark could just sit here and talk all day about being middle children, I'm sure. <laughs> I mean, it, it is an, an actual phenomenon, you know, and... Uh, I hear about it all the time from the other two. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's something. And then, you know, for me, I have a rather checkered past. I have three different marriages and one child from each marriage. So I have three only children, effectively. Yeah. Uh, although they all love each other and... and have my uh, some of my traits. I, the, my girls hopefully look more like their mothers than me. So, uh, <laughs> but yeah, you know, being a middle child, I mean, I, it's it's pretty much documented. You know that uh, quite often they are more artistic and um, 
where they have to fight for their position in the family. The youngest one is often, you know, coddled and babied, and the eldest is, you know, burdened with being adult way too soon. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah I get to, I love, I get to tell this story on our podcast about my sister where she, you know, she was older, five years older. And so she was responsible for babysitting, you know, because, you know, our family, you know, both parents worked really hard, you know, factory workers. And, you know, my, my, my sister, she would make me as soon as they left, go to your room. Oh. And, and then, and then if we can't try to sneak out of our room, she'd come back and smack the door with a belt. Wow. <laughs> so wow. we had to find other ways out. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I didn't know if your, your relationship with your brother was like that. <laughs> oh yeah. We, 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 we fought all the time. In fact, <laughs> gosh, I recall doing something to my brother and, um, I was, I hit him or I did something and I was running down the hallway and at the end of the hallway was the bathroom and I ran into the bathroom and then right as I shut the door, he had thrown a knife and the <laughs> knife stuck in the door and I opened the door and I saw the knife and quickly shut it again and locked it. It was like, yeah, crazy times. Yeah. It, it, Similar it story, but it, not a knife, flathead screwdriver. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh, wow. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right. We're supposed to be interviewing. Paul. Yes, we need to talk about no, the movies. Moving right along. Oh, I thought we were having a psychoanalysis session. <laughs> well, we could. <laughs> we could, but we're we're armchair psychologists at best. <laughs> Who in the hell let you become a philosophy major? Ah, uh, my dad. I mean, you know, I went off to a small state school in Maryland, and uh, uh, you know, it was a liberal arts school. Um, in fact, I didn't go to school thinking I'd even do theater. I, I I drifted into the theater department only because I was looking at, you know, what to fill my schedule with. And it was like, oh, theater 101, that's an easy A. I'll, I'll do that. And then was cast in a play mm -hmm. um, um, as Bo Decker and help me out. Um, oh, shoot. I didn't write down play i am so sorry i have all this yeah. and i didn't write down the play bus stop william bus stop. Yeah, yeah. Bus. and uh and that's when i got bit again with the acting book because you had the chance to go professional it was your dad who stopped it from happening correct when you were a child yeah when i was like you know 10 years old arena stage asked if i joined the company and my father just flat out nixed it i cried but he was like no he, he, he said mark <laughs> He said, Mark, look at these other kids, these theater kids. He said, you know, I want you to have a life. You've got to have an education. He said, look, you know, once you graduate, I can't tell you what to do, but you're going to at least finish high school. And then luckily enough, I mean, I was flunked out at high school, but I made it to college. And luckily, when I was at Frostburg State College in Upper Maryland, mm -hmm. um, one of the professors, Dr. David Press, uh, was a real method acting yeah. uh, aficionado and so i got a really good foundation and start uh in understanding what method acting was uh, from him before i went to the drama center in london where that was a program but the acting side of it um, was run by a woman called doreen cannon and she was one of the hoggins proteges so mm -hmm. we got American method acting, we got European style training, and drama center was very particular. We had a very specific uh, training called movement psychology, which is particular to that school. It's still taught, but not quite as detailed as it was when I was there. Because now, when I was at drama center, you started off with 60 people, and you ended up with 16. Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah, it's kind of like law school as far as you get that big class and then they call people, correct? It's not like that anymore. Exactly. Yeah, now it's like they have a class of 100 and nobody gets cut. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the city council runs it now. It used to be like a private uh, institution. Mm -hmm. but, but yeah, I mean, I, I had a really tremendous training. In fact, you know, you know, people like Colin Firth and right. Tom Hardy, Michael Fassbender all went to the drama center. Mm -hmm. Colin went to drama center when it was like when I was there. Yeah. Um, but the other guys, I think, went when um, it had become run by the city council. Yeah. Chad. 
So I, I got a question about method acting since that was your approach. I mean, uh, you know, lately method acting has, well, it's kind of died down, but for a while there, it was really under fire about, you know, why is it so important? I wanted to get your thoughts about that. Cause you know, a lot of actors have been getting a lot of criticism for their method acting uh, off the top of my head, Jarrett Leto, um, that oh, I'm forgetting the actor from succession, Daniel day Lewis. Daniel so day so Lewis is a great yeah. example. Yeah. Of staying in character 24 uh, seven. Yeah. That's that to me that that's bogus. It's, it, it wasn't what I was trained to do. It's not, that is not method acting. Mm -hmm. That is his idea of what it is to, to do method and have a method approach. Yeah. Um, I mean, if you ever read Stanislavski, you never, you know, offered up that, you know, you, you must be in character 24 hours a day and only call me your character name. And, you know, quite frankly, like people that I train uh, with train actors like Anthony Hopkins. Yes. Right. Anthony Hopkins did the same training I did. The so people that I knew, in fact, when Anthony Hopkins uh, or, and even trained with, uh, uh, although Olivier didn't train in the, in, the movement psychology he worked with Jan Malmgren who was the one of the founders of the drama center mm -hmm. when he was doing Othello mm -hmm. so uh, yeah yeah the thing about being on in character 24 7 that's all bogus that's bullshit I, I think it's like a, a veil and uh the real man yeah it is it's bullshit. I was gonna say it's almost it's almost like it's done for publicity like it's something to feed to the press I think it's like somebody's insecurity. Like they feel like they, first of all, it's impossible to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm sorry. I mean, look, and if you need to do that, if you need to be in character 24 hours a day on set, you'll be exhausted. You'll have no energy to actually be the character. And I'm sorry. I mean, look, you know, I'm not a fan of Daniel Day Lewis. I'm not even a fan of Jeremy Strong. Uh, but Daniel Day Lewis to me, I, I mean, I've seen some performances that I think were great. I mean, his first performance, you know, uh, um, my life was my left foot. My left foot, foot, the one he won the first Academy Award for. Yeah, great, great performance. But I mean, Gangs of New York, like, what a joke! I mean, he was overacting like crazy. I mean, that's so. So, what I was taught was the art of transformation. Yeah, and that is, and that's what real method acting is all about: is transforming yourself into the character, into the world of the piece you're doing. And that's the challenge. If, if you can actually immerse yourself into a character, and some of it has to do with looks, but it really has to do with like the essence of the character and you adopting physical attributes, vocal attributes, psychological attributes. I mean, if you, and if you can really hit all of them within the context of the piece uh, and people believe that you're some something other than yourself, that's, that's the method challenge. Which so, I think... Uh, and honestly, in your career, you there's several examples of you doing that perfectly. Not to kiss butt, but no, I thank you. No, I know. <laughs> like I, I, I love being a character actor. I was never under the delusion that I was, you know, Brad Pitt or Tom Cruise. I always knew that I was a character person, and uh, I that that's always my challenge is to be believable as something other than myself. Yeah, and I love it. <laughs> And when you do lose yourself in the moment in a character, um, it, it's it's magical. I mean, it's magical. It, it, it's, um, it's, I often say, like, I, I was in the group. I was in the moment. I was, you know, when you, when you, when you find that sweet spot, um, mm -hmm. and Morgan Freeman, when we were doing Shawshank, but his definition of it was, was just talking. Mm -hmm. you know, now, of course, you can just talk, but if you talked and you have adopted all the other aspects of the character, well, then that's transformation. So that's that's what it's about. So any any actors out there want to challenge me on it? Like it, it, it it's become it's become a joke about uh, you know being in character for the four yeah. hours. Chad, you got the next question. While I was it? Uh, yeah, I was just kind of curious. Um, so you're talking about your is there is there a specific role that you have it where you, where you remember where that was your sweet spot like one particular role and can you talk about that i've done it quite often but i mean like i mean shawshank for one not so much it's not alien so much but shawshank for one but uh i played um where you be killing all of america <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah 
But uh, I played Clive Davis in a movie about uh, Whitney Houston. And yeah, um, directed by Angela Bassett. Yeah. Yeah. And people didn't recognize me. In fact, when I was in drama school, this was a great thing. Um, I, you know, because when you get to the performance here in my drama school, um, it was really designed so that, you know, directors from theaters all around the UK would come and see you perform. But uh, one of the first pieces we did was a um, Fado farce. And I I went for it. I was playing a character called Henri Mitvok, and I was German, and I was rotund, and <laughs> I actually shaved out the inside of my hair, and I went for this whole makeup and walk and the whole thing. And the people that I, I rented a room from a woman and her daughter, uh, who was like a little sister to me, they came to see the play. And the young woman kept saying to her mom, like, where's Mark? Where's Mark? She was like, honey, I don't know. I don't think he's come on stage yet. I'd already been on stage. I'd been on stage for like 40 minutes. and <laughs> They didn't know it was me. And that that's the sweet spot. That's that's the best that's compliment amazing. you can get. That's what you go for. Totally. You were, I, like I, one of my favorite characters, and it's only because um, I was on set. The uh, uppity ups producers were away on a location scout. They left one of the underling executives there to just marshal everything on the set. And they were he was kind of loving what I was doing. He let me go um to the point where when i was watching with my family and we're on the couch my youngest kept inching down the couch away from me and i was like what the hell, where are you going come back here she's like no dad you're creeping me out like why why are you talking like that and and that voice and you're so weird and creepy it's like i said sweetie i, I mean in, inwardly i was going yes i did I <laughs> But uh, and that was actually a character that I originated for Supernatural, of all things. Oh, wow. Alistair, the demon of all demons. Yeah. <laughs> and we talked about that a little no, bit. No, I was dressed. And, and it's one of those of, and I, and you don't have a good answer of why that, right? Of why, why, why we didn't get you back on, why they didn't get you back on the show. I think it was a number of things. I think it was the fact that um, this this producer let me go to the degree where I improvised around the script. Mm -hmm. I outshone the boys. Yep. You know, and God bless them. They had a good long run. They're very successful people. And but that's not hard to do. Well, you know, I'm, I'm not going to be. I'm glad you no, said No, 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 no. They're great in those roles. And I, well, yeah, I've they're, seen, they're not heavyweight actors. They're not heavyweight. I, I can I give you an example of my from and by the way, as far outside of Hollywood as possible, not a trained actor, but a great Padalecki, great example of smell of fart acting. And this is it. <laughs> Am I wrong, Mark? No, I think that's pretty accurate. <laughs> if you steal that and use it in an interview, I want you to tell everyone this Good bastard in Lexington, Kentucky gave me smell of fart acting. And I don't know if I stole it. I've done it to chat. I've talked to Chad about it. Ch another one who people love. Uh, and he's not a terrible, he's great in the right role is Charlie. Is it Hunan? I can't say. the. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I know. Got that. It's like, oh, that's not gravitas. That's not. That's, that's just, yeah. I know. I hear you. I hear you. But I think oh, also part. the reason why I didn't continue was that I think it was a bit of ageism. A, I think I was too. I made too interesting a character. Yeah. And I can't be more interesting than the stars. See that that's that that's often been to my detriment. It's like you know, I'll approach a character, I'll make it interesting. I I had a director friend say to me, he said, he said, look, I love it, but it's just, it's just too interesting. It's like you know, you got to you got to tone it down a bit because you know you're you're not blending in with the stars so um and i think it was a bit of ageism to be honest because um you know the show is geared toward a female audience and you know yeah. the, guy, the guy that they replaced me with you know is a slightly well definitely younger but uh you know a bit more rugged ruggedly handsome kind of guy so hey it's okay it's all, it's, it's all good i have kind of a bullshit question okay i want to know the truth when you were meeting with marty and you were going to get the departed. Did you look at him and say, this is how I'm going to get this. 
Daniel Day Lewis's performance was over the top. No, Did you ever tell him that story? No, That's never. True. Because he, you, no. you have said in interviews, and I've heard it from before. He's a, he's a direct Cameron, much more of a technical person, and then Scorsese is an actor's director, right? He'll let you play. You never felt that comfortable. I'm assuming that. No, no. Well, you know, look, look. Uh, working with Mr. Scorsese was amazing because. Um, uh, well, in a, in a subsequent interview, he said that he really enjoyed my performance, which I am very grateful for. But, you know, the day that I did my death scene in the uh -huh. movie, um, you know, we shot like 10,000 feet of film on that scene alone. And that was a tremendous day. Uh, and at the end of the day, his first AD came to me, Joe Reedy, and he said, hey, uh, listen, Marty wants to know, is there anything else you want to do? He'll, he's willing to roll cameras again and anything you want to try. And I'm thinking in my brain, I'm thinking, hang on a second. We just shot 10,000 feet of film, <laughs> covered this scene six ways to Sunday. And if I were to say, oh, yeah, like, like, like give me another take and then not do anything. So, you know, you'd look like an ass. So I just said, Marty's happy. He said, he's happy. I went, I'm happy too. And it was great, you know. Um, but, but yeah, just to say, uh, um, Marty's an everything director. He's not just an actor's director. I mean, he he has got all the bases covered. Mm -hmm. I mean, he's extraordinary. He's like the Energizer Bunny. He just doesn't stop. You know. Yeah. He's, um, I think the, the real actor's director for in my, in my career was uh, John Frank and I. Yeah. We were doing Wallace. Now he was an actor's director because a he loved that. He loved that. Even though there are stories of of him having some rows or is having some fights with some famous stars throughout. His oh, 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 absolutely! In fact, I mean, I can tell you a couple of stories. I mean, a like, on set, on set with Frankenheimer, if there if the crew was making noise, and he was a big man, tall man, you know, and yeah. he did an actor himself, but He's he'd an be opposing like, person. He'd be like, "God damn it, be quiet! There are actors on this set working." I love it. Just love it, right? I, you rarely hear a director do that. Yeah. But one of the funniest thing ever happened was we were doing this long tracking shot uh, coming up onto uh, Gary Sinise when, uh, as Wallace, mm -hmm. when Wallace realizes that he's doomed. And they do this long tracking take, and it was absolutely brilliant. And they shout cut. And Frank and Ivor goes, great, let's move on. And Gary Sinise was like, uh, 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 John, uh, excuse me, and they did this little confab for a second. And then Frank and I went, God damn it, Gary, I've been in this business 60 fucking years. You don't think I know when I got a take or not? You know, and, <laughs> and, and, and Gary was like, Oh, well, of course, of course, <laughs> and demure. But, um, yeah, you know, a lot of the world is, 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 is pretty technical, especially in the TV side. You know, it's, it's very fast. You know, Hit your of, mark. But, but, yeah, actors, directors, it's interesting. The people use the term all the time, you know, they use the they use the phrase all the time, actors, directors. Yeah. I don't know. Who are some know. of who are some of the ones then just the other than Frankenheimer, which that's a great story, who are some of the other ones that are just just batshit wonderful? Wow. Um I mean I mean, really Jim Cameron was, even though he's not an actor's director, he was wonderful. I mean, just because he was so detailed he was so immersed in everything on aliens i think it's his best movie anyway it's uh, his it's the most rewatchable yeah and 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 he was fiercely invested in it i mean it took eight years from when he wrote it to when it was made um and, and a lot of tv directors i mean i'm, I'm going back on uh botch legacy i, I just that's okay and one of the directors, a regular in the regular rotation, is this guy Patrick Cady, great cinematographer, but is now is now a director, and mm -hmm. he's he's phenomenal. Um, but yeah, out of all the things I've done, I think Frank and I stands out the most. Um, That's a really good yeah. story you told about him, though. Do you have any more about I mean, Frank and Um. Well, it was, it's interesting, you know, we, when we rehearsed Wallace, 
it was much like we did with Shawshank. We actually taped out the set or the stage, like the floor, like we were doing theater. Mm-hmm. And we rehearsed quite a bit. And uh, yeah, really, I remember my audition with Frankenheimer and, and he, he turned to me and he, he said, he said, you're a very fine actor. He said, you know, you're going to go places, kid. And it was like, <laughs> it was really chuffed about that. I mean, another another great director, uh, Dick Donner. Yeah. Uh, but he was old school Hollywood, Dick Donner. I mean, he was old school. He was just like big, boisterous, and um, but but great fun. I don't know. I've always been one. It's like you know, I'm I'm, I'm always well and over prepared when I when I get on set. So um, again, that's part of my training. Um, don't leave, leave anything to uh, guessing. But uh, yeah, no nobody else stands out for it, really except for those and. You well, you worked with an old school director, if you don't mind me talking, because there's <clears throat> I know it's a flawed movie and I know you're in it. And I'm I'm thinking there's probably a bigger part there that was left on the cutting room floor. But there's parts of it that I still love. But you worked with Irvin Kirshner on Robocop too. Say that. <laughs> What'd you say? I knew you were gonna say that. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I, it's fine. No, in fact, it, I, still, what the problem is is about five years ago. I was watching it again. Why? I have no idea because I'm a geek. I was watching it again and I was thinking there's just three different movies here. It's, At it, least it, three different movies. There. I was just approached uh, to to participate in a documentary about RoboCop 2. Yeah, and they I, just did one called they, I just watched the one about RoboCop a while back. It came. In fact, I went ahead and bought the Blu-ray. I didn't even I'm I'm much I'm t- I, you know, if I get a book, I get a book. I don't have a Kindle or any of those things. So I tell them, so are you going yeah, to? Anyway, uh, they, they approached me and I just said, I said, I'm sorry. I, I, I really have nothing to offer. It was a very sad experience. And the reason was, was that the, a, a fellow actor um, was really not up to the game and it was miserable. And the actor was, cut out and because I did all of my scenes with a particular actor the actor was cut out and consequently I was too and it was I did not know this story I swear to God I did not know this story Mark I'm so no, sorry but, but, but it was one of the most miserable times ever I remember going to the premiere and Kirshner pulled me aside and he said hey listen I'm so sorry uh, you're going to be disappointed I, I had to cut you out of the movie almost I, I was like what it was a shock. It was a shock. But hey, yeah, that's that's the and it was probably because of the point you just made. It was like two disparate films, and 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 something had to go right. It uh, it just is. It's it's like a bag full. Well, I was going to say a bag full of shit, but I don't mean it as an actual shit because there's some there's some decent stuff there. It's just several different movies, and no, it it's clearly one of those sequels. Orion's in financial trouble trying to get the movie out. Nobody's who's running the ship, who's actually making the decisions, yada, yada, yada. Yeah, it, it, it's it's always that. I mean, that's the sad part is like, you know, like when Aliens, you, mm-hmm. who was running the show, um, Scorsese running the show, Garabont, not so much, like because it was this major film and you know, the studio was breathing down his neck and yeah morgan freeman's talked about that before about you know oh so some magical things were cut out of shawshank if you, if you can believe that it's as magical as the movie is there are some romantic amazing cut out of the film from my own uh perspective i mean it still works you know me getting beat up in the, in the cell but what was supposed to have happened was i not only get beat up in the cell but they dragged me out and they tossed me off the fourth tier of the of mm-hmm. the cell block and they had this shot set up which was would have been great they had it all set up mm-hmm. there's a cable running from the floor up to uh, a rig above us and they'd approach me and said are you willing to do this shot I, I, i'd have to be suspended in a harness for a lot of the day yeah and the trick was was that i would be suspended as if i was hurtling toward the floor and they run the camera up the cable so it creates this false illusion of me act actually falling. And that's why the line and, sh- and Boggs never walked again 
that's that's why that line is there. But yeah. they had to cut that out. But this other this other piece, um, and it would have been just incredible. But they cut it. Um, you know, when uh, Andy gets out in the, the the creek and he does all this thing yeah, yeah. in the script. He actually runs back up the hill toward the prison, right? And the audience would be going, no, no, dude, wrong way, right? And as he's running toward the prison, there was an actual rail line that ran outside the Ohio State Penitentiary, and they had down the way a vintage steam locomotive oh. rented and ready to roll. So the story is that Andy goes back up the hill hops on the train and that's how he got to the next town so quickly he was able to deposit the money in the bank and get away oh still works but what you learn is the next time you watch the film as andy's in his cell and he's looking out the window what we see now is just andy looking at some clouds and you think oh he's you know wistful about being outside mm-hmm Truthfully, what it would have been was you'd see these clouds and you would hear the steam locomotive. And then when he escapes, you as the audience would have gone, oh, my God, this guy not only managed to crawl through sewers, but he timed his escape to coincide with the arrival of a train. I yeah. mean, it, it was it, it was romantic and magical. I, I, I begged this producer, I, 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 Nikki Marvin, I said, Nikki, don't cut that, don't. But it's the one of those little things, um, and it, you know, there's a great book, um, Shawshank: The Final Shooting Script. Mm -hmm. That's actually in that anecdote is in there. Um, the movie is still extraordinary, but it, that was just one little thing. God, I wish they'd managed to shoot that. But they were behind by three days, and the studio came down on them and said, "Hey, you got to cut something." And it's, see, that's when you know the powers that be get in the way because they're not creatives. Right, your money people. Yeah, and that's when you lose. That's why Mr. Scorsese has such a brilliant uh, uh, foothold in all of filmmaking is because he negotiates his final cut, and mm -hmm. he like like for example, The Irishman. Mm -hmm. Now, the anti aging technology wasn't perfect, but I actually think if that movie had been cut thirty minutes shorter. It would have probably won the Best Picture Award. Uh, mm -hmm. Really, I think it's a fantastic story. But uh, I, I agree. Too. But but Marty, it was like a fuck you to Netflix because Netflix had given him the money to make the movie, and he got a fee. But there was no when you work with Netflix, there's no back end. Right. Right. And I think he was like, "Oh, okay, fuck you. You're, you're you know, you're going to give me my director's cut." guess what? I'm going to make the longest fucking movie I can possibly make and I'm going to enjoy every minute of it. In fact, tonight, after I talk with you, I think I'm going to sit down and watch Killers of the Flower Moon. And I wonder if it's a similar situation because I, I want to see why this movie is three and a half hours long. I haven't watched it yet. Yeah. It took me a while because of having a young, you have children and having a young child. If you've got a three hour commitment and you've got to get the kid and you got to work tomorrow, that's a two night commitment. Sometimes yeah. three, so it's it was a three day. It was a three day watch for me to get through the Irishman. <laughs> but I enjoyed the hell out of it. I like, did too. It's just kids. It's kids. Yeah, and yeah, yeah but, uh, for me now, it, it, it's my wife. I mean, she's like, I'm not watching that. I was like, why? It's supposed to be. No, I'm not doing. I'm not doing a three and a half hour movie. Yeah. You know? Whereas Oppenheimer, it did not feel like a three hour movie. That movie just moved. Oh, I, I, I think the best pictures. Yeah. Well, oh, no, okay. Barbie. <laughs> actually, I haven't watched Barbie and I'm trying. Barbie's going to win awards. Right. Barbie yeah, like I, it? Awards. Oh, I loved it. I did too. Oh, it was extraordinary. In fact, I, you know, I kind of went begrudgingly. Same here. You know, I went my wife and my daughters and my brother and sister in law. My youngest is like, oh, and everyone has to wear pink. And I'm like, oh. So we all had fun. It was great. We're going off, but I had no idea I would laugh so hard. Right. Such a fabulous time. And I think it's possible Greta Gerwig could win best screenplay. Just saying. And I do think Ryan Gosling could well win best supporting actor because he was he was freaking brilliant. 
right you like heard that, it here first. See, what he did what he did that was method acting because in that kind of movie in that kind of role he could have winked at the audience and go hey you know this is i'm just having fun no he played that thing so earnestly and for real that's why it was just so darn funny he 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 slayed me. god that was him. all right jad yeah so we talk about you know uh method act or not met character actors i'm sorry you know really bringing out a film and and that's why honestly a lot of my favorite actors of all time are character actors and us getting uh, excited when we see some of our yes character actors. um i and i this is why i want to talk about eraser because <laughs> eraser yeah it has james Kahn, it has arnold schwarzenegger it has james coburn for god's sakes but it also has you robert pastorelli james cromwell uh uh, oh, Joe Vitarelli, John Slattery, for God's sakes. I was wondering, do you have stories about working on Eraser just because of of the the great the, the great cast? Well, a lot of my stuff, I, I, I didn't get to work with a lot of those great actors. Right. Oh, so, happy to be on it. Uh, and, but the only stories I really have to tell are two. Go for it. One is a late night shoot about 2.30 in the morning and I suddenly hear this ruckus and I hear, you got motherfucker, I'll beat the lip. And I go outside of my room and James Kahn is jacking up this AD and I mean, he is banging him off of the trailer. I told you never to fucking knock on my door. You're supposed to tap on it. I, I was like, hey, Jim, Jim, cut it out, cut it out. Like, what are you doing? Like, he was jacking him up. And then the other story is his, um, in the big final shootout. Yeah. The last take, um, uh, uh, Russell, the director, was like saying, hey, guys, just unload your weapons. Just fire indiscriminately. Just just, just let it go. So we're just letting it go. And I feel something hit my eye. And I'm thinking it's just like we're kicking up dust or something. And I went to the makeup trailer and I was like, hey, do I have something in my eye? And they're looking in my eye and they're putting eye drops in and eye wash. And everything's like, no, I can't see anything. I said, man, I feel like I've got something gritty in my eye. Anyway, my brother happened to be visiting that night. And I kept saying, God, my, and my eye looked fucked up. It was red as hell. It was really messed up. He said, come on, we're going to go to the emergency room. I said, no, nah, man, it's, it's three in the morning. But I'm going to go home, man. It's, all right, we're going to the emergency room. Go there, get in one of those little machines, the eye machine, right? And they're looking yeah. in my eye. And the doctor goes, oh, yeah, there we are. There was a shard from one of the shell casings that had flown out and pierced my eye. <laughs> and the doctor said, you are so lucky you came in here tonight. He said, he said you could have gone home. And by the morning, you wouldn't have had an eyeball because he said it was already oozing. He he very deftly plucked the shard out, and it was you know I you, he had to see it with you know magnifying glasses, but he plucked it out of my eye and put some sort of antibiotic uh, or steroid spray on my eyeball. And you know I begrudgingly had to tell my brother, hey, thanks. That's the second time you kind of saved my life or saved part of my anatomy. When we were kids, like young. We, it was one winter and there was a tree falling over a creek and you know we were climbing across trees and everything and I fell into the creek and through the ice and I got swept away by a current and I remember this vividly I'm like under the ice and I'm being swept down the stream and I can see my brother on the, the, the bank just going Mark Mark like, you know, and I, I, I couldn't do anything you know and he finally grabbed a log and he broke the ice in front of me and fished me out of the stream so thanks to my brother who sadly we don't get along and haven't spoken in many many years but he did That's save funny. my life twice <laughs> <laughs> wow yeah. i want to talk a little bit about your tv work because there it's so ex i mean not only are you a fantastic character actor and that but you're fantastic and you've had so many we talked a little bit about this in Richmond as far as <clears throat> I love the documentary, that guy and that thing that you're in and that you talk about. And all of you talk about doing Star Trek. 
And as I was telling you, you, there's no reason for you not to be at every convention because it's, if it's not Star Trek, it's Star Wars. If it's not that, it's the shield. If it's not that, you're in a great Tales from the Crypt episode, by the way. Yeah, Tales from the Crypt. Now, that was great director, Kevin Yeager. Yeah, who, Kevin Yeager, who designed the Crypt Keeper, correct? I'm the Crypt Keeper. He's also a tremendous special effects makeup mm -hmm. artist. Um, wow. Joel Silver producing, uh, Stefan Garage, and uh, I'm sure you knew some of those people from working in the Lethal Lethal Weapon too. It's Joel Silver, right? Yeah. Right, yeah, like, yeah. working with Dick Donner and all that. Richard yeah. Donner was one of the producers as well. Is that yeah. how you got the Tales from the Crypt gig? Yep, yep. Because I, it's funny. I remember when I was doing Lethal Weapon two, and I went in and did my auditions. I was doing the South African accent. Mm -hmm. I remember in the room, Joel Silver went, "How the fuck did you? Where, where'd you get that accent?" And I, I just said, called a buddy of mine from South Africa last night, and he gave me the rundown, and I, and I was doing it perfectly. I've got an ear for accents. But yeah, you're a good mimic. Yeah, very. I have that from a child. Mm -hmm. But uh, Tales from the Crypt I love because having trained in England, I was extremely believable as an English con man. I love that role. God, that was such fun. And I one of the best improvs I've ever done, improv. Yeah. After Stefan Garage, like, you know, sticks me with, I can't remember what it was, a pitchfork or something. Yeah. But, I, but I'm like, <laughs> I, I, and I improvise this, like, I'm like, taking this, this shot and I go, good God, Sickles. <laughs> you know, like, it's like, look what you've done, but it's like, good God. <laughs> it was such fun. Oh, yeah, that was, that was, that was a great series. Great it series. was a great series, but you've been on a ton. Of, you, I mean, you, uh, you are on the shield another great show great fantastic show. and a great show that i you know we hear about breaking bad a lot and breaking bad is fantastic better cause all those but i don't know that the shield gets its credit today what do you think i think you're right i, I mean, think it's a precursor to that just like the sopranos is a precursor to all of this the shield yeah. was was visceral all, all, all. and how they got it on fx some of the shit that they got on fx is as if you go back and watch it and know that was in the early 2000s how did they get it passed because yeah. that was on cable television yeah great writing mm -hmm. uh yeah michael chick was fantastic uh it, it all comes down to the writing that's why i'm enjoying bosch so much now right Connolly, what a prolific incredible writer and amazing person okay it's so rare that you have the creator of a show around even yeah he's on he's on set every day he's on set every day and it's not like you know he's not in anybody's way he's just hanging in the background i love it because when i was i play a character called lieutenant thorn yeah and um you know i, I remember once i was giving like a, a, a briefing to a bunch of police officers in the morning and, and i just happened to look up and saw Connolly in the back of the room and all he did was he just gave me a just gave me a wink and was like, "Good, good work." Because you know? he he was a he was a real detective, a homicide detective, like thirty. Right. Years. I just did a, a little short film this summer, um, a Connolly short story, which is one of his only not like police uh, or L.A. based uh, uh, crime story. It was a nineteen thirties poker game that goes awry. And very, very happy that uh, Titus Welliver uh, asked me to come on board. Again, just great writing, great. I, I'm, I'm, we're hoping that it might be the springboard to a, a full-length feature. That'd be, that'd be fantastic. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. So yeah. I, I, I just love doing period things anyway. No, no, I, I, that's what, it, because, and I know I promised you an hour and we're getting close to it, but we, the, Back to you going back to a mimic, and I don't want to cut Chad. Chad had a couple of questions he wanted to talk to because you, your voice work, and you've been a natural mimic most of your life. And from video games to animation, I don't know that people, because sometimes I forget, and this is a compliment, I forget that you're in Lethal Weapon too. Yeah. Yeah. Even though I'm a huge Richard Donner fan, even though I've seen that movie, blah, 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 I forget. And it's a compliment. I hope you take it that way. Uh, absolutely. 
No, absolutely. And there's a couple other roles that you slip into. So I know Chad wanted to ask about the I'm desperate. I'm desperate to play another role where I can do the Afrikaans accent. It's such a great accent. Uh, yeah. And definitely Joss Ackland, who played mm -hmm. you know, my boss, Lethal Weapon mm -hmm. 2, passed away this summer. A uh, great actor. Yeah. Lethal Weapon 2, it was, uh, was, it was a good time. So... <laughs> So Dick Donner, uh, like I, I don't want to segue. No, Chad. no, no, please, no, if no, go, no, great please, do. Dick we, Donner story. We, we, we want to hear these stories. We have always, we love, we, are, we love hearing behind the scenes stories. Yeah. yeah. Okay. This is, so you know, I have. Uh, excuse me. <clears throat> they have the uh, Krugerrands in the trunk of my BMW. Yeah. And it was not a souped up BMW. It was souped up in the fact that they had put like a souped up engine in it, but inside the the car very you know uh, rudimentary seats and stuff it was just meant to move mm -hmm. Dick Donner comes out and he's like all right kid this is what you're gonna do I want you to hit it right up that ramp and just go up there hang a left at the top of the ramp and uh loop back around okay and and don't worry the guy the guy's up there he's holding traffic he'll be looking out for you okay okay go let's go go do it so I'm slam down the gas this thing you can just feel the power of this vehicle going up this ramp as i'm getting to the top of the ramp this is downtown la i see the guy who's supposed to be holding the traffic he's laughing and talking with some, he's not even paying attention and i'm suddenly like oh shit what do i so i gently like pump the br brakes down a little bit i make the turn and come around here i'm coming down the other ramp here comes dick donner kid kid i told you what are you pumping the brakes for? He said, yeah, just hit the gas. I said, Dick, the guy wasn't holding traffic. He's like, God damn it. He says, so, hey, get me sure he's not holding the traffic up there. All right, kid, this time just, just hit the gas. Man, I went right up this thing. When I turned at the top of the ramp, I thought I was going to fishtail and lose control of the car. But I make the turn, and I was starting to fishtail, and then this engine, I could just feel it, like, grab, and it just went... Right up my ass. <laughs> took it off. I mean, I'm telling you, it was the most exhilarating feeling of all. And then when I came back down, he was like, there you go, kid. That's the way to do it. <laughs> so it's such a Hollywood moment, you know. It so, is, but when you do. <laughs> Donner called you kid. But when you do the voice, you just sell it. You just sell yeah. it. It's like, it's, like, it's like he's got one of the old megaphones out there yeah. talking about. <laughs> It's got the pants and the riding crop and the, the 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 thing. I just love it. He was old school, man. Great guy, great guy. But yeah. but what we hear a lot is gruff but lovable. Toe, toe, big man. I mean, he 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 was an on set general. I mean, most directors have that anyway. I mean, he, you know, even Scorsese was you know, tiny. Um, um, you know, commands the set. I mean, my God. I mean, I'll never forget. You know, there was a hierarchy in Departed of how people arrive on set. You know, it's like the background mm -hmm. people, then secondary actors, and then it would be uh, uh, Leo, and then Nick Nicholson, and then Marty. And mm -hmm. if he on the set, and he couldn't like walk on set and say action, he would turn right around and walk right off. If something was wrong. So we, there we are, we're, we're in, in, in Red Hook, Brooklyn, yeah. at this huge old warehouse. And it happened. Marty came onto the set. And we're all there. We're all there waiting. And he goes, Joe, this first. Like, what the fuck is this? What the fuck is this? Joe so he's like, uh, it's the location you chose for the scene. He's like, oh, no, 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 not feeling it. Not feeling it. Um, no, send everybody home. Uh, no, we got, we got to do something about this. They sent everybody home. And the next day, we were at a different location to do the scene. Amazing, right? But that's the kind of a man for saving that. But I'll tell you another one. I'll tell you another quick funny story. Please, please. We're, that's what we're here for, is for yeah. our listeners want to listen to you. Now, this is a good one. Yeah. I hope Mr. Scorsese never hears it. I'll he never... won't. We're, we're nobody. I'll, I'll <laughs> never work for him again. But, um, so, you know, it was quite an arduous process getting the role. Like, I, I, I had to do taping, like, four times. And I just kept getting notes like, yeah, die a bit more, rasp a bit more. I was doing the death scene. And um, 
so I kept doing these tapings and finally my agent says, hey, you're going to go to the Beverly Hills Hotel and you're going to meet Scorsese for your final audition. I'm like, okay, great. And they were like, oh, and by the way, you're going to have to say every single word that you, your character utters in the script. I'm like, okay, strange, but okay. So uh, I drive there and I'm, of course, extremely excited. And I get there, I arrive at the villas of the Beverly Hills Hotel, which is up the hill. And I pull up and I look down and I'm out of gas. And I'm <laughs> out of gas. I go, oh, fuck. And I hop out and the valley guy comes and goes, listen, please do me this favor. Here's $40. I have this audition I've got to go to. But could you please take this down the hill uh, and get me some gas? He goes, don't worry, we have gas here. It happens all the time. I said, please, whatever you need, this is for you. Go to the villas, um, and we're waiting. We get ushered up to this one of the bungalows, and you know the door opens, and there's Marcus Christmas, and he is like just put together. I mean, cufflinks, the loafers, well, everything is just like it's amazing. Mark, come on in, sit down, sit down. Yeah, great. Like we're gonna read all the all the words. Okay, is that okay? You okay with that? Yeah, I'm fine with that. You're fine. He sits down in a chair and his feet go about 18 inches off the floor. <laughs> and I swear to you, I had to bite the inside of my lip not to laugh. I almost, I almost laughed because it was his, it, the, the visual, which is still seared in my brain, was hysterical because he's so gracious. Everything sits down and he's like, oh, oh, <laughs> he's on a chair. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I bit, I bit my lip so hard, and then we actually said every single word, and then it was like, "Thanks very much, thanks for coming in." I drove away, and uh, you know, back in those days, you know, I've got three children. Uh, you know, being an actor, like people think it's like, "Oh yeah, you make a shit ton of money, and that's all you do is act." I, I've done, I've sold everything under the sun. Mm -hmm. Back then, I was designing and selling kitchens for a big kitchen company in Los Angeles. Oh, really? And I had a kitchen appointment to go to, and I was like, oh. Oh, I go there, I drive all the way there, and on the way there, my agent calls, she goes, you got it, you got it, you got your part you're going to be going to back and forth from New York and Boston for the next six months. I'm like, okay, wow, incredible, incredible news. And I'm outside this house to go to this meeting. And I call my wife and say, honey, I booked it. And I, I said, you know what? Put the champagne in the fridge. I'm coming home. I'm blowing off this meeting. <laughs> I never went to the meeting. In fact, I, you know, I went into this company and I said, look, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll still work for you guys, but uh, I just booked this movie. I'm going to be gone for the next six months. I'm, I'm coming back and forth. And oddly enough, I made more money selling kitchens that year <laughs> than I did on The Departed. Wow. Because that was... It, it was like oh four oh five and uh um, you know before the downturn but it was yeah. back in the day the banks were giving away money to people to like home improvement mm -hmm. loans i made like three hundred thousand dollars selling kitchens that year because i would walk into people's houses and first thing it was always the tell was the woman would say oh hi please have a seat would you like a glass of water I the soda if you like and i would just turn and i'd say you've got a home improvement loan company how did you know i'm getting a kitchen and then the husband would be next to her going oh, yeah she's good. <laughs> but how many, i've got we've got i i know you, i know we promised an hour if you don't mind just a couple more quick how yeah, often are, are you sure okay cool but, and usually people are like, oh, they're, they're not awful. So we'll go do a few more minutes. But how often while you were doing that, did somebody go, holy shit, Drake or Boggs? I often got, you look very familiar. <laughs> I would say this. I would say this. Let's see. Now, if you're thinking of James Conn. <laughs> people tell me I look like Jimmy Conn all the time. They're like, oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, you do. You look like James Conn. Now. 
when James Conn was doing that show Vegas, uh -huh. I auditioned for it. Again, got out half an hour later, my agent says, guess what? You booked it. Great. Half an hour later, the agent calls and goes, uh, scratch what I said before. I go, why? Huh. James Conn saw your tape and said, this fucking guy can't be in the show. He looks like he's my brother. So, <laughs> you have two James Conn stories. You have two, two James, James Conn stories. stories. You yeah. have that, yeah. Apparently, Burt Reynolds met uh Frank Sinatra once, and then just Sinatra, and then the shit happened, the, the story happened, and then Burt gets up to leave and he goes, Aren't you going to stay? He goes, No, I already had my Frank story and walked out the door. <laughs> oh, wow. And while you were telling me that about Jimmy Conn giving the guy the business, I was, was going through my head is like, Oh, because I've met a couple of people and I have a couple of stories, and I always go, oh, I got my story. Yeah, I got my story. Exactly. They were exactly what everyone said. I've got my story. It's a good time. Chad, real quick, do we want to talk? About, do you mind if we talk, ask you a couple of questions about voice acting before we go? Okay. All, right. All right. Go ahead, Chad. Oh, no, it's just uh, out of the three of our, uh, three of our, our friend circle here, I am a huge, huge animation fan. I, I had like my whole collection of movies and TV. Like I, I have a whole selection of cartoons and animation um that i watch regularly and uh you know you do a lot of voice work in video games and and animation mostly for a lot with warner brothers and dc i was kind of curious about that but mostly from an acting standpoint i mean is that hard on you being in a room where you're used to off other actors and then you're usually in a room alone well interesting you say that because times have changed but back in the day when I did the original Batman cartoon mm -hmm. series, right, Kevin Conroy, who was, by the way, a wonderful person, whom I have done panels for for the last four or five years, and was fan. I just sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Was fantastic with fans. I didn't work with him like you did, but I bet I over the years I did five or six moderated panels like for you, and he was. He was a gentleman. He never talked a lot, but with us, but when he, he was fantastic with his fans, I just wanted to say that. Yeah, he's a lovely guy. But, but in those days, we'd all be in one room. The entire right. cast would just step to the mic when it was your time and you'd move off of them. <laughs> now, uh, well, when we did Voltron, um, we would have like six to eight of us. But then the pandemic changed everything. Yeah, right. And that, that was very strange. But I... I I started my career doing voice work. Uh, I, I, I'm an expert dubber. Mm -hmm. I, my first professional job was I dubbed Jackie Chan in a couple of his titles. Yeah. yeah Drunken Monkey, Drunken Master, and there's one other I can't remember. But um, so when I was doing Rush Hour with Jackie, and I just happened to say in a quiet moment, I was like, hey, Jackie, by the way, um, when I revoiced you in. Drunken monkey, drunken mask, and he looked at me like, What? You, me? No way, no way. I was like, Oh, yeah. And it's, and, and, but yeah, I bought my first car with that money, and uh, um, I love it. I love voice work. I love, I, I love working on the cartoon. Like, like to, to be a character in the cartoon, it's the great experience. It is the best work. You go in once or twice a month. And pays all your bills <laughs> and and I, I i but i i just i i just love love character voices and uh and but trust me the voice world is so competitive right oh, oh, oh please i mean i i've been in rooms with guys and it's like like dude bow down i mean guys who can do shit with their voices and uh, impersonate i mean it's extraordinary extraordinary now i'm not at that level i, I enjoy what i do and i you know, like I'm having a fantastic time on the Spider-Man in mm -hmm. French. Just started working on a virtual reality. And since I since I saw you guys, yeah, Tucky, I got this virtual reality game. And I can't tell you what it is, but it's going to revolutionize everything in game. It it, it blew my friggin' mind. I'm telling you, I, I'm going back again at the end of this month and following month. Uh, it's and you, you'll do it like Warner Brothers. It's again, it's a Warner Brothers and Meta production. 
Oh, wow. And, uh, I don't know what it is about Warner Brothers. They, they love me over there. I've done so many things with Warner Brothers. Um, I, I love working for them. There's always great people like the Batman Arkham Origins game, right? Dude, that's great. Yeah. Great. Just, just great, great people. I don't know. There's something about being on the Warner Brothers lot. It feels comfortable. And that's where I auditioned for Departed, you know, uh, out of Warner Brothers. So, yeah, mm -hmm. voice work. I, you know, from a kid, like I, I said before, like I, 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 would, I, I would mimic. I, I was a mimic. I used to imitate people all the time and get into fights with the game. But, um, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's, a, it, it's a genre that uh, it's kind of timeless. You know? It is, yeah. Yeah, I, I am. By the way, I am playing Lego DC villains with my youngest daughter. Um, I did not know you were in it because we have not got to the Deathstroke level yet. So now I'm going to have to rush uh, her so I can get to you. <laughs> that's great. But you see, that's the thing. It's interesting. I, I was watching um, uh, like Taxi Driver mm -hmm. of the holiday. And I thought, wow, this dated. It's really dated. And I, you know, and, and even. Dare I say, but like De Niro's performance, like because when I was coming up, his performance as a taxi driver was shit. That was like, right. <laughs> but I, watching it again, I'm like, oh, it's not really that scary, or mm -hmm. I, I don't know, there's something about it. But for me in my career, I am so lucky to have been in some timeless pieces of art. And I, you know, Aliens is one of them. Shawshank is another one. Uh, I, I imagine Departed will be be one. Uh, I don't know. Rush Hour, like in, in, for action comedy, is yeah, it, you know, pretty stellar. So yeah, I I, I just I, I'm very 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 lucky and uh, love what I do, man. I know. And one last one, one last one. The Comrades of Summer with Joe Montana, directed by the Kentuckian Tommy Lee Wallace. Tommy Lee, great guy. Yeah, yeah. I, I had a I had a ball on that. I had a ball on that. I was only I was saddened because when at the uh, you know the the Iron Curtain came down at the end of our shoot, and I yeah. was to go to Russia. I was so excited, and then it all came down. They're like, no, no, we'll just take the skeleton crew. We uh, can't all go. Wow. Um, but boy, yeah, what great fun! I, you know. I tell you guys, it's like one of those things that you know that people say, like you see, you tell your children, it's like, you know, find something that you love, find something that will make you wake up every day. And uh, I'm so grateful to my father, who, when I said to him, like, and I, I said it with trepidation, because my dad was a military man, worked for IBM, uh, and very much a corporate military kind of guy. Mm -hmm. But when I was 18 years old and I said, Dad, I think I want to be an actor. And I said it like this, thinking he was going to be like, are you fucking out of your mind? <laughs> My dad was very pensive. He said, well, you know, it could be a very hard road to hoe. But he said, you know, technology being what it is, it's going to race ahead. And, you know, most people probably won't be smart enough to get off their couches and stop watching the boob tube. So might as well watch you. <laughs> and that was my father's ringing endorsement uh, for me to go off and be an actor. But honestly, no one in, in my entire family uh, has ever been an actor. Uh, no one since. My son, thank God, is a producer. My youngest daughter, uh, arts administrator so she wants to be in and around the arts but doesn't want to perform yeah and uh, it's hard to say how you get drawn to these things but i, I gotta tell you I, I i i i will never stop because i don't have to and yeah. i love i absolutely love what i do and it isn't the only thing i do and it, i'm going to do it every single day but um this year already it started off i've got a full schedule and it feels great and I, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky. You Bless. get, you get paid to do what you love, and there is no greater satisfaction. Um, it's, it's amazing.
is afforded so many great things. Like my wife and I just got back. We were we were guests of the Marine Corps in Okinawa. Oh, really? Because of aliens. Yeah. Wow. Me and Jenna Goldstein and I went over there. And uh, I got to travel to Japan. And my wife and I spent an extra, like, like we spent 16 days tre trekking around Japan. Guys, go to Japan. Go. Oh, I want to. We have young oh, children right now. So I understand. But the dollar is really strong, but you've got to go. It is the most extraordinary place. I love the culture. Everyone, everyone is so respectful, kind, clean. Talk about clean. Mm -hmm. I have to come back to the shithole Los Angeles. I mean, disgusting. So <laughs> Japan was extraordinary, extraordinary and beautiful. Oh, the food. And all the, you know, we got to find it. I want to thank you so much. You're you're a minch. We appreciate it. When you go to Portugal, we will we will introduce you to Todd Farmer, the screenwriter, who's also from <laughs> who's also from Kentucky and a friend of the show, who's bought a as he calls it a wee castle over there. No, no, no. We're going to head and stop recording. Thank you so much, Mark. And if you'll hang on, I'm just going to push stop. Uh -huh.